for refuge and full enlightenment to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merits of giving and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge and full enlightenment to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merits of giving and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient I go for refuge and tell him enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merits of giving and the other perfections, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. So just take a moment to kind of uh, you know, focus on developing bodhicitta motivation. Maybe I'll just, I'm just going to share very briefly one reflection I had just from the last class, and then we'll pick up where we left off. I was, um, this isn't in the text, it was just my own reflection, but I'd to share what it's worth. I was, I was contemplating this point about the um, all-pervasive compounded suffering, right, of samsara. So like the, that fundamental level of it, that it seems I call it existential suffering. And, uh, you know, we were talking about last time about how His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Geshe Sopa, you know, the commentators on that, point out that one of the, one of the main points about that is that, I'll, I'll read that quote again. Uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama says, the psychophysical aggregates right, are a kind of slaves to the afflictive emotions. Or Geshe Sopa says, the very condition of being born into samsara means your psychophysical aggregates are the results of karma and afflictions and are a seedbed of future suffering experiences. <coughs> right, so this point of like, we're out of control, right? And like that, um, you're not under your own control, you're under the control of your own, of ignorance, of afflictive emotions, and of karma. It's, it's one way of understanding, a deep way of understanding that point. What was striking me personally as I was contemplating that was just how, um, it seems strange in a way, but true, that to the extent that, or when, as we grasp, when we grasp, we all, as we always do, so our grasping at an independent self, um, let's see, let's see this right, puts us out of control, actually, right? that's what it's saying, in a sense. and that's one way of understanding this point, right, but it was to the extent that we're, or as we grasp at this independent self, right, because the irony is, of course, or the problem is, is that there is no independent and then, the, so, and then we fight against, and are hurt by, and destroyed by, uh, dependent origination. Actually, right? Like, so we're grasping at something that's independent, and then the process of dependent origination makes us suffer over and over again. 
And what seems strange is when we realize dependent origination, right, that there is no independent self, so when we realize dependent origination, then we become free from that. And we actually aren't any longer out of control. It just seems strange. So as long as we grasp at this sort of independent self, it's like we're fighting against reality and we always lose and we suffer. And when you can let go of the, the, the idea or the belief in an independent self, then you're no longer out of control anymore. It just seems strange, right? This issue of dependent origination and this kind of suffering. I'm just reflecting on it. But anyway, today we're up to the section. So we're still on the, we're still, um, because remember, we're in, in terms of the Four Noble Truths, right? We're still on the, the truth of suffering here, right? Uh, and this, we're in the middle scope where we're understanding, um, you know, developing the wish for liberation from samsara, right? And so we're contemplating suffering. So we've gone through the eight types of suffering, the six types of suffering. Which are those types of suffering, just remember, those two, li the, and we also kind of implicitly, or as part of the eight, we covered the three types of suffering. So those are different lists, right, that apply to all of samsara. Now we're looking at the specific sufferings of individual realms. Does that make sense? So the other ones were like, what's the word, general points about suffering that cover all the realms. Now we're going to say, if you're trying to understand suffering, another way of doing it is to focus on the suffering of specific realms. Um, and so Lama Tsongkhapa says, uh, you know, first says, so um, uh, in terms of the suffering of the individual realms, first there's the suffering of the three lower realms, and Lama Tsongkhapa says, this has already been explained, right, because we just had a whole section on the suffering of the lower realms. Um, and so he doesn't, what's the word, he doesn't review those same points over and over, but there is a point I'll just make here, which is, you know, when we s were meditating earlier on the sufferings of the three lower realms, it was to develop a wish to have a future life in a better realm, right, remember that? And so that was that scope, right? The low scope of practice, or the, you know, the practice in common with the low scope, where you think about the suffering's lower realms in order to strive for a better rebirth. Um, I will mention that, you know, it's an important point, I think, is that here, you can again meditate on those sufferings of the lower realms, but in this case, it's not to develop the wish for a better future rebirth. If you meditate on them here, it's this recognition, you would, it would be with a recognition <coughs> If I don't achieve liberation, I'm going to keep experiencing those over and over endlessly, right? And even if I succeed in going up to an upper realm, I'm going to fall back down to those. And you can actually contemplate, you know, if you, in this school, if you think about the lower three lower realms, you would think, I've been to those realms countless times, and if I don't achieve liberation, I'm eventually going to go back there. Even if I create good karma in this life, <coughs> and I get reborn as a human or a god, um, that won't last, and then I'll again fall back. And that will happen over and over. And if you, um, you know, that gives a different feeling, right? Like the one feeling was, in the low scope, you would be feeling like, um, you'd be feeling like, right now I'm human, any moment my breath may stop, then I may fall to lower realms, that would be horrific. I have to create good karma. It's like a, a, it's like a small, small scope in a way means a shorter focus, right? It's like, I may die in the next few years, or next few hours, or next whatever, and I don't want to fall there, and that would be hor horrible and frightening, which is appropriate, right? And so I want to purify my negative karma, create positive karma, take refuge, and so on, in order not to fall there. Here, your mind has a wider scope, actually, right? So you're not just thinking at the moment of death. You're actually thinking, well, even if I die and go to a better realm, let's say I'm a human again, well then, we know what the human realm is like, right? Like, um, next time I may be born in a situation where you know, it's already hard to have a good mind in this life, right? My next life, I'm going to be born somewhere in some family or situation or town or country where there is no teaching, there is nobody to help me learn anything. Then I'll make all bad karma, and then I'll fall to lower realms. That's not satisfied. That's not good enough, right? Like I have one more life in a human and then fall to hell or something. That's not good enough. So you start to contemplate here with a wider scope, like recognizing, wow, over the course of um, the long future, right, of eons, I'll again follow the lower realms many, many times, over and over, and like that's not acceptable. So I must achieve liberation from that cyclic existence, that samsaric existence. So my point is just, um, in terms of the suffering of the three lower realms, the contemplation of, of what they're like is the same as earlier, but here you would be thinking of it in, term, in this broader scope. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, next... 
Thomas Mankapa turns to the suffering of human beings. And um, one good thing about this, <laughs> this topic is that we are familiar with it. So we can contemplate it based on our own direct experience. This is a good one to spend time on, I think, uh, experientially speaking. Right? And so um, Lama Sokapa goes through a number of different examples. Right? So he says, first he says, uh, this consists in the sufferings of hunger and thirst. Right? So if you were contemplating this, right, you would stop and you would think about, wow, so like uh, in this human realm, right, there's incredible suffering of poverty. Right? That's what he's getting at there. Right? The suffering of um, poverty in this world. Um, and, uh, you know, especially, I'll just mention very, I don't want to go into too much detail, but if, especially if we're living uh, here in this area, right, then um, it's easy sometimes to become insulated from that. Right? There's to forget that there are people who are uh, starving, for example. Uh, although, you know, I don't know that far away, but, um, but to stop and to contemplate that point, right? And you can, you know, uh, Lately, I don't know if you ever do. Sometimes, what I, nowadays, sometimes if I'm going to contemplate a certain point, I, like I'll um, sort of Google images or something like that beforehand to help, like you know, or do that. Like I don't know. So I started doing that sometimes. Like if I'm going to contemplate a certain point, like that, Google images of people who are going through that kind of suffering, um, you know, and then put away the computer, go meditate. But as a kind of reminder of what's happening in the world, like, you know, a war zone, for example, like looking at what's happening in Aleppo. That, and then go meditate, looking at what's happening to the refugees, other people, just to sort of as a reminder, because that's not living in this area, you don't come across that necessarily every day. Even in like New York City, you do actually more. Right? If you're walking around New York City, you sort of see more what other people are going through. In Northern Virginia, in your car, with a little, like little insects going around or something, <laughs> insulated, and we don't always see things. So, my point is, is that, of course, human beings go through terrible suffering like that, right? Then um, he says, unpleasant contact with heat and cold. <clears throat> and actually, you know, we can expand that, right? And there is unpleasant contact. What he's getting at there is that, um, right, he's talking about just, he's talking about us on a physical level, right? That we experience hunger and cold, we experience all kinds of physical suffering, right? Um, and so we can contemplate that. Then he says one, um, your frantic activity. Can anybody relate to that one? In the commentary, they say, you know, uh, they point out that human beings have frantic activity uh, seeking, always seeking something. Right? Human beings always want something. Uh, so sometimes we're seeking wealth, sometimes a relationship, sometimes status, sometimes um, respect from other people, sometimes um, you know, new, new stuff. You know, sometimes it's money, sometimes it's stuff, whatever. Um, but that it's frantic and and if we get caught up in, you know, this isn't about that, but if we get caught up in the worldly concerns, then that's endless. Right? Um, that frantic activity never ends, and you just die while you're still frantically running around trying to collect stuff, and then you lose everything when you die. So uh, it's not a good way to live. Right? <coughs> and then, of course, frantic activity leads to the next one, which is fatigue, uh, which is kind of funny. <laughs> so, uh, and actually, isn't that true? Like, it, especially, I mean, you know, it's quite true, isn't it? In other words, we're so busy, you know, I mean, I mean, if you talk to almost anybody, right, we're so busy, like, working and handling all the stress and responsibilities that then you're exhausted, right? Um, and he's saying that's part of the nature of human existence and suffering if you're not, unless you get liberation, right? unless you're practicing the path to liberation. <clears throat> then he says... Uh, he says also you can apply those other, right, the, the list of, um, he says, you, in addition, you should understand the seven types of suffering. So there we went through most, uh, birth, uh, aging, sickness, death, um, meeting with the unpleasant, separation from what is pleasant, and seeking what you desire and not getting it. Those are the seven. Um, and what he's getting at there, just remember, like, again, we can just contemplate this a little, right? It's a wonderful, this is a really powerful topic, right? Because if you start to contemplate that, like, right, like what he's getting at, and I've talked about this before, so I won't say too much, but this whole point about, right, we're always seeking something, like he says, right, and then he's pointing out, right, says, right, the seeking and not having is a suffering, right? like when you're seeking it and you don't have it, you're not satisfied, right? 
then sometimes you fail <coughs> to get what you're seeking. Then you suffer worse. And then he's saying that sometimes you um, you get something and then you're afraid of losing it. Right? That's another kind of suffering. Uh, then you have to protect it, which is another kind of stress. Right? <coughs> and then eventually you lose it, which is another kind of suffering. And so he's saying, like, we have to analyze our own human experience because sometimes people don't... Um, We don't think about it that way, actually, right? But that's what he's pointing out. I mean, you know, now, when Lama Sankapa wrote this, there were no computers, right? But I'll just use that as the example, right? Like, so, like, it's stressful, right? Like, if you want to buy a computer, right? So first, like, you, it's stressful that your old, old computer broke. <laughs> Jeff said that. But it's, it's stressful when your old computer breaks, right? So you have the suffering of losing something, right? Then it's stressful, like, where you start to go, well, what kind should I buy? And, like, I don't want to get ripped off. And maybe it's a faulty <laughs> one. And... Like, you don't want to get, like, a lemon, you know, that just, like, doesn't work properly or that has a new operating system that you don't understand, right? So you get stressed out about that, and it's, like, a stressful process to research, right? Um, and then when you go to the store to buy it, it's, like, not, not that fun, right? And then, like, and then this is the suffering of, so that's the suffering of suffering in a way, right? Then you buy it, and you think, oh, yes, I've got this new, beautiful computer, right? But then, immediately, the suffering of change starts, Right? And it's true, actually, isn't it? Like, so you have to worry. Like, first of all, there's the worry. Now it's new. If it breaks now, that would really suck. Right? And then, like, if you start to put your data on it, well, then you have the stress of, of like, backing it up. Right? Well, what if I lose all my data? And how do I back that up then? Because it's not enough just to have it on there. And so on. And then there's, there's this recognition, right? Like, and even, like, some people have, when they have something new, right, that when it gets the first, like, mark on it, then, like, that's the suffering, right? Oh, now it doesn't look new anymore. Um, Anyway, so the point be, you know, and then it's like the stress of, actually, and I think it's true. There's the stress of learning how to use something, and then by the time that's done, it's already becoming obsolete. I guess, I don't know, like, it's already started becoming obsolete. So that's the suffering of change, in a way, right? Even having it is not, it's not secure, right? And the point being, there's no security in this kind of life, right? I'm just, I use the computer as an example. The same would apply to anything, right? A car or whatever object. And so what Lama Tsongkhapa is saying here is that, if we analyze our own human experience, there's no ultimate satisfaction right? in any external experience or even in our own body and mind. Right? Um, and so he's saying, don't think of this as like a final refuge, this human life. Right? A final refuge is liberation. Um, then Lama Sankar makes an interesting point. He, he quotes a text, and he says, all the suffering... Now, this is, if you're sitting meditating, right? He's making a point for your meditation. He says, all the sufferings of the lower realms also appear to exist for humans. And then he says, and then the commentary explains, to a lesser degree. But what the point here is this, is... So first we can go through, right? He says first, um, troubled by, the suffering, by suffering like beings in hell. And so what he's getting at there is that we're not, we don't suffer as much as hell beings, right? But actually, of course, like, there are beings who freeze to death, right? Humans who freeze to death, right? There are humans who are burned to death in fires, right? There are humans who drown and who are, you know, are, and are, who are tortured, right? Uh, physically tortured and abused and beaten and so on, right? And so that's like the suffering of the hell realms, right? And so we can actually contemplate, oh, in this human realm... We're not in hell, but it can be almost like hell, right? And actually, if, I mean, um, uh, maybe you haven't. I, I mean, for me, I, like, uh, it's not hard to think of examples like that, right? Um, moments in your own life where it's, you could look around and go, oh, wow, this is like hell, right? And then certainly moments of other people's lives, right? Where your friends or relatives, when they tell you their experience, where you think, wow, that sounds like hell, you know? And yet it's part of the human experience, right? And recognizing, oh, that's an inherent part of the human experience is that we have these, what's the word, like, analogies to the hell experience. Right? Uh, and then he says, uh, also, I'm adding the word also, subjects of yamas by their poverty, right? So there he's saying hungry ghosts, right? And again, like, you know, the experience of hunger and thirst, right? The experience of, it's not just that, though, right? The experience of, like, Actually, I'll just pause for a moment. Like, e each of these also, the hell and the hungry ghost, I don't know, if you, like, even if you watch your own or other people's dreams, right? Sometimes people have dreams where, it's, like, it's almost like being in that other realm. You know, like, people have nightmare, 
where people have dreams of extreme poverty or something, and it's almost like they tasted the suffering of this other realm. Um, but then also, like, this subject of yama, the po- so being like, a, the suffering of humans being like the suffering of hungry ghosts, one could be like extreme poverty, right? But then there's another version of that, right? Which is like, we sometimes have the experience where, like, nothing you have, like, you can relate to it in your own experience, where, like, sometimes either if you're overwhelmed with desire, right, for anything, right? Or, like, you can't rest because you so want something. That's like that, right? And then there's the suffering, like, when, um, what's there, say this, right? Where you always want more, right? Um, and if we look around, that's so common in human experience, isn't it? I mean, and it doesn't, it's the horrifying thing in one way is that, as I mentioned this before, is that it doesn't, you know, Lama Sokapa at another place says, um, beings, what's there, beings follow desire to get satisfaction, but they end up just increasing their own desire. Right? And we can all relate to that at times, I think. It's part of the human experience, right? We're like, I'm going to say it right. You know, like, you know, it's like, um, like the suffering, for example, of somebody who, when they drink too much, right? or eat too much, I mean, drink too much alcohol, or, or eat too much food, or something, right? Where it's like, you're so craving that you make yourself sick, right? Or, and then you wind up feeling horrible, right? Like somebody has a hangover, right? They drink so much and and they end up with a hangover. They eat so much and they feel like vomiting. Right? Well, it's like a hungry ghost, actually. Right? It's a human experience that's analogous to the hungry ghost realm, where we're so controlled by our desire that we destroy our own... Even it, It's like, not only on a subtle level are we destroying our own happiness, it's actually gross level, right? Where you become totally miserable. Right? Um, you know, or the same thing, right? People who spend so much that, like, you know, their credit card debt becomes humongous, right? And they're like overwhelmed with the fear of their credit card bills and they can't pay their bills and so so I'm just I'm just expanding on what Lama Sokap was saying here but he's saying like you know if you think of all those kinds of suffering where they become like so extreme right where the person can't then the person's like totally overwhelmed with that suffering does that make sense kind of like that he's, he's saying we can contemplate these kinds of points and recognizing wow like the human realm is filled with all kinds of difficulty and pain you know um and then he says, um, they also have the suffering of animals. Powerful ones oppress the weak by force, inflicting harm on them. And there, again, what he's saying there is he's, get, he's just focusing on one kind of suffering. You, know, you can think of the various kinds of suffering of the animal realm, right? Because there are many. But here he's particularly talking about one of the sufferings of the animal realm is like, and this is true actually, right? Like many times, I mean, uh, people will point this out, that uh, like in modern society now, at least in theory, we say there are human rights, right? basic human rights. Not everybody <laughs> gets to experience, you know, gets to have the benefit of that idea, but at least it's an idea, right? But actually, there's not even that idea in many places regarding animals, right? So, um, you know, so like people don't, um, what's there to say this, right? Like working an animal too hard or locking animals up in little tiny cages, right? Like I'm talking about like chickens or something, right? Like, like you know, the, the, if you ever see videos of that, it's horrific, right? And, um, and what he's saying here is that, like, there's also, they're all kind of, like, people beat, you know, like, some you know, people beat their horse or their mule or their whatever, things like that. And what he's saying here is that human beings, when we have, like, a bad boss, right, he's saying it's analogous to that, right? Like, and, and if you've, you know, if you've had that experience or you know someone who has, right, who has, like, a really abusive, we, we, we call it, what, a toxic environment, a toxic work environment, or there's another word for that, too, I can't remember, uh, there are different terms like legal ed or the people use like when they file what's it called complaints, right? But at least we can now the one advantage humans have is at least in the US we can file a complaint. May or may not get help. Sometimes it doesn't do any good at all, right? But the point here is like the sense of being oppressed by those who are more powerful, right? Um, and that could be politically or it could be at work, or it could be but you know, where you're treated like and sometimes around here, especially you see that where people are what's weird, like I mean, as this, in my work, sometimes I talk to her, I'm like, you work how many hours? You know, like, like you know, that's inhumane. inhumane. I would, might even say that's inhumane. Human beings aren't, aren't supposed to work that much. It's not for our, our bodies aren't designed to work 20 hours in a day, right? Like, especially not many days in a row. Um, and so the point being here that, uh, you know, so some, and sometimes even people do, and then, uh, you know, the sufferings of slavery, for example. And things like that. These are all part of the human experience, right? Part of the human realm. And what Lama Tsongkhapa is here saying is that 
we can think about those and recognize they're like the suffering in the lower realms that human beings experience, and it's, uh, as I say, and it's completely overwhelming, right? And that's why he says, by the force of inflicting harm on them. Uh, and then he says here, the line, the, the line actually says they are rivers, as it were. And the meaning there is like, it's actually an important point. What he's saying with this analogy of the river, what he's saying is it engulfs us, right? It like, and I, I use the word overwhelm, right? Like, in other words, that sometimes the suffering of the human realm in these kind of times, it's like, you know, if you imagine somebody who's like standing a river and they get swept away, right? And they're completely, what's the word? Like in the rapids, right? Being battered against the rocks. And they have no control over it. And oftentimes, we human beings experience it like that, right? Where if you say to somebody, well, why don't you change that in some way? They say, I can't. I, like, I, you know, it's like, I'm totally overwhelmed. I can't do anything about this. And, that, and this is not to judge those people. It's part of the saying, Lama Sukhava here is saying that's part of the human experience, right? Is that we, we sometimes get engulfed and overwhelmed and swept away by these kinds of suffering. Um, and what, again, what Lama Sukhava is saying here isn't like to think about this just to get depressed. That's not the point. It's to, it's to recognize this is our existential situation and we can change this, right? We can, we can escape this through the practice of the three higher trainings, of the Dharma, and so on. But first we have to recognize it and want to change it. Right? If we don't generate the wish to for liberation, then we'll never become liberated. Like it even says that in the Uttara Tantra. It says one of the benefits of having Buddha nature is that you can develop a weariness with samsara and a wish for liberation. But in the Uttara Tantra it says if you don't develop that, if you don't think about suffering, then you don't develop that wish, and then your Buddha nature never doesn't awaken. It only awakens when you generate the wish for liberation, the wish for enlightenment. And so in order to generate that wish, we have to think about these kinds of suffering. And I think, personally, I'm just saying, I personally think that these human ones are, I think in Ken Shrimshay said that in his commentary on the easy path, that they're particularly beneficial because we can relate to them more. Does that make sense? I mean, we can relate to all these points about suffering, but these are kind of easy because they're our own realm. Um, and then uh, Lama Sukhapa quotes Arya Davis, 400 stanzas here. Uh, and this is interesting, he says, Higher ones have mental suffering, lower ones have physical pain. The world is overwhelmed by these two types of suffering every day. And so what he's saying there is, you know, lower ones, he means like, um, by lower ones he's talking about like people who are less powerful and have less wealth, right? And so he's saying those who have less wealth and less power, they main, mainly have uh, physical sufferings, of, like heart, uh, what sort of like, uh, hard labor, fatigue from hard labor, uh, worry about having enough, you know, like a illness and not having a doctor, uh, not having enough food and drink and things like that, right, to sustain oneself in a healthy way. And so there's a lot of physical hardship and pain. And he's saying, so when you're in the human realm, when we're in a lower position, that tends to be our experience of suffering. And he says, then if we rise up to a higher position, we no longer have the physical heart, like if you rise up and you're more wealthy or something like that and have a higher position, then you're no longer having the suffering of, of like the physical hard labor. You have a doctor, but you can afford a doctor uh, at that point. <laughs> and you don't have as much um, physical fatigue. But then he says, then you have mental suffering. Right? He, and, that, and it's only as often points that out. He says, you know, um, it's only as often because he travels the world so much, right? Often points this out where he says, you know, if you're in a, he points out if you're in a third world country among the majority of people, then you see there's a lot of physical hardships, right? And he says, then when you come to, um, you know, gatherings of more well-off well people, you see that they have so much stress, anxiety, depression, um, and so on, right? Those kinds of suffering. Um, and that's true, actually, isn't it? Like, um, I don't know if you've had that experience living around here, where sometimes I think, oh, wow, like, I was saying this the other day to somebody, like, you know, the experience where you look around and you think, like, wow, people in other parts of the world, I know people, you know, wish they could come here and have this, the life that I, of the people I'm bumping into, and the people who, and then you bump into people who are, have that life, and they are totally miserable and sometimes, you know, wish they were dead, for example, right? Like, and you sort of say, wow, like, that's the human realm, actually. Like, and actually, it's very common, isn't it? Like, you know, people having totally overwhelmed with, uh, suffering, you know, and like, 
<clears throat> because there is no, right? And it's not that they want to, you know, maybe they, they go, now I want to go have that life. But the point is, is there is no place, if you're living a normal samsaric life, there's no place that's satisfying in the end. Um, because real satisfaction comes from wisdom. So it doesn't come from these things. So then Lama Sankapa says, you should reflect in accordance with these statements. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, his co that's his coverage in this text of the suffering of the human realms. Any thoughts or questions about that before we go on to demigod? Straightforward. <laughs> so now he's going through the three upper realms, right? So one is human, next is demigods. Or sometimes they call them anti-gods. Demigod, anti -god. Ashura. Ashur, Ashuras are the gods and then Ashuras, so anti-gods or demigods. So it says here, it is said that the demigods are mentally tormented by envy. Sometimes they call them jealous gods also. It's another uh, phrase that appears in text, jealous gods. Uh, because they cannot bear the wealth of the gods. Uh, when based on that, they fight the gods, they experience many sufferings and have their bodies chopped up, split, and the like. Although they possess intelligence, I'll get to that. Set. So, uh, first of all, what it's getting at here is that these uh, jealous gods, I'll call them in this context, they're beings who, like, oh, sorry, this right, have like a, they live longer than humans, they have a kind of, you know, they don't live in the human realm, they live in another realm, right? But um, the description of them is that they're, in, they're intelligent in the sense they can think, you know, they, they can strategize. They're like, and they can see that they're like, it's almost like if you imagine, um, let's say this right, like, <laughs> my analogy for a moment, it, I would imagine it being a little bit like, um, it's actually a little bit like, <laughs> I don't know, like, a, I don't know how to describe this right, like being somewhat wealthy, but surrounded by very, but, but when you see very wealthy people, uh, where you're like, I want to have what they have. So it's like that. Um, so these, these jealous gods are like beings who have much more, like they have more than human beings, but they can easily see the, the pleasure of the gods who have more, much more than them. And so they feel jealous and envy and angry that they don't have what the gods have. And so it's said that uh, they make war with the gods. But the problem is, is that, of course, um, they don't have as much merit as the gods, so they generally lose that war. So like they got, kind of gather together to go fight uh, the gods, and they go and fight them, and then they lose their battle, and then their envy is worse, plus they're physically injured, and so on. Or um, we're f fully ripened obscurations. What's that? There's a phrase here, fully ripened obscurations. Oh, so that one is a different point. That's another kind of suffering. What it's saying here is, although they possess intelligence, right? So it's saying, in that realm, they're not um, dull-minded. Right. There is their intelligence. But what it's saying here is, because they have such strong obscurations, like jealousy, anger and desire, in that realm it's not possible, those beings cannot achieve the path of seeing. That's what it's saying there. So because they have so many obscurations in their mind, they're not capable of achieving the Arya path in that, from that realm. Uh, what's the difference between a fully ripened obscuration and an obscuration? Oh. I mean, aren't they all fully ripened? That's an interesting question. Fully ripened obscuration. Yeah, I take it. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I take when I read that, I took it as um, as saying strong, strong. Yeah, I powerful. I think it's, it's got to do with the karma, the fully ripened karma part of it. So the previous uh, birth, they have accumulated so much of fully ripened karmas that it give all the obscurations. That makes sense, and it, it obscures them from seeing the truth. So. In one of the um, in Geshe, uh, what's the name, from Lama Son, in, who passed away from in Sudo Lama Son Kappa? Jabba Gatsu. He was interesting. He described, I guess he was using some other text. He was describing the suffering of the demigods. And um, he didn't use this, but it was like, as he, he was describing what it's like, one of the kinds of wars they had. And I was like, oh, it's like the uh, Iliad. Remember, you know, the ancient Greek story, the Iliad? He was describing how the, that the, uh, the gods have, 
the gods, and there are gods and goddesses, right? And the goddesses are very beautiful. But then if the demigods have a particularly beautiful daughter or wife, the gods will come and steal her away, just like in the Iliad. You know? And then the, the, um, then the demigods go make war to try to get her back. And so, so they do that over and over again. I was like, oh, this is like reading the, it's just like the story of the Iliad, of, you know, uh, where the, uh, you know, that same story, right? What was her name? Helen of Troy. So, um, but, so it could be that, or it could be like the physical object, the wealth, the palaces. The, but so they're jealous of those things, and they continually fight. And one more point I'll make is like, again, we can, um, Lama Sagaba doesn't say this here, but it actually it's true. That again, like, we, as human beings, we're not demigods, but you can see the versions of that, right? Like, I sometimes actually, person, this is just my own personal thing. When I first moved to Washington, D.C., I was like, oh, like, this is like the human analogy of the demigod, right? Washington. Like, I was like, other places have other kinds of uh, <laughs> like, uh, issues. Right? In Washington, like, because Washington's issue is not really, uh, you know, say it right, like, it's, you know, wherever somebody is, they're trying to get, like, everybody wants to move up and become more powerful. Uh, and mostly they end up uh, miserable, right? Uh, and I'm not sure if you're more miserable if you succeed or if you fail. <laughs> Both are definitely miserable. I think it's probably worse to succeed um, than to fail here. But, but I sometimes think Washington has a lot of this quality. First, this is just my own reflection. I don't know if you guys agree, but definitely a sense of like people wanting more, more power in particular. Um, more influence, more wealth, actually, too, which is amazing. People could be, because both, for the most part, people who come here from other places, occasionally maybe, I don't know, maybe sometimes people come out of altruism, but a lot of times people come out of some desire for, to have more <laughs> of something. Um, okay, so that's the suffering of the demigods that he's mentioned here. And then uh, next, Lama Sankaba talks about the sufferings of the gods. And he, it's broken up into two different sections. And this is an important point that we've covered a little bit before is that there are two types of gods. And, and remember, like, uh, God realm is this topic, right? Not a, it's a small g. I just want to make that point. It's not, this isn't like a, the creator of the universe. The Buddhism doesn't believe in, in a god who created, right? There is a, the universe is created through interdependence, dependent origination, right? So this is the suffering of God realm, you know? Um, right, and um, so Lama Tama makes a point here that there are two categories of gods. There are the... Um, Desire realm gods, and then there he calls them the, uh, or the text says, then the uppermost realm gods. So we'll start with the desire realm gods. Uh, and that's, because that's where he starts. And he's talking about the suffering of those gods in the desire realm. So I just want to remind you, who are the desire realm gods? Right? So the desire realm gods are um, <coughs> beings who are not human, right? They're in a god realm. And so they have, a, because of their good karma, they were born with um, great wealth, pleasure, and power. Um, and so there are various different god realms. And in a way, like, uh, you know, they, they correspond, I mean, many of the descriptions of the gods uh, in Buddhist literature uh, are the same, you know, come from the descriptions in uh, Hindu literature. But, um, so you can read about you know, those kinds of beings all kinds of divine beings, you could say. Um, but it's mostly they're in these kind of pleasurable realms. Um, and uh, in many ways, they're comparable to, you know, if you study uh, other cultures, though, they're similar, right? Like the Greco-Roman, uh, some of them more like jealous gods, some of them more like gods. But they're similar kinds of figures, if you read the stories. Um, you know, or other, other cultures that have these descriptions of those kinds of beings. But so, um, okay. <coughs> So Lama Sankapa lists, so you might say, well, hey, wait a second, that sounds pretty good. They're in like a realm with pleasure and power and wealth, and why would that not be played? You know, why is that not ultimately satisfying? And so Lama Sankapa points out various kinds of suffering. So the first one is, um, has two parts. Uh, the first is dying and transmigrating. And so that, what it's, what it's basically saying is this, is when somebody's were born into this kind of God realm, they... Um, they sort of have this very lustrous, sort of healthy, strong, physical body there um, that experiences great pleasure. And they sport, they play around with the other gods and goddesses, right? Uh, but then it says, uh, remember this point from earlier, um, everything that's born dies. Right? Uh, 
all everything that comes together falls apart. That f famous and very true Buddhist point. So one is the god, even the gods, the beings, in the, if you get reward in a god realm, you'll eventually die. And what it's saying here is, um, so the gods, they never think about death, right? They're totally like caught up in their own pleasure. Um, and then there comes a point when f there are five signs of impending death if you're in the god realm. So all of a sudden, and here it says, <laughs> a hideous body complexion. Other texts sometimes talk about it as losing their luster. So like the gods have this kind of really, you know, if you think of like, um, it's like much more extreme than this, but sometimes, you know, if you look at um, somebody who's like young and like vibrant and very happy and sort of, uh, they have a, there's a certain kind of luster, right? Or a certain kind of like charisma or a certain kind of glow that they have. So the gods are said to have that, but much more so. And that when their death starts to approach, they lose that. And actually, compare that for a moment. Imagine this. Like, if you think of, like, what if you see somebody who's, like, young and attractive and sort of very successful at the time? It could be, like, um, you know, any kind of success, right? Where they're, like, there's a certain kind of, like, physical, I say right, what do you call it? Luster or aura or energy that they seem to have. And then if you think of someone approaching death, like an elderly person, is almost a, we call it a pallor, right? Mm -hmm. A kind of like, um, if you're ever with somebody who's dying, right? There's a look, like an emaciated kind of gray, almost they look gray in a way. There's like, like a grayness to them and a lack of color and a lack of vibrancy. So what happens if you're in the God realm is for a very long life, you have that kind of brilliant, vibrant luster and suddenly you get this kind of pallor. When it says here a hideous body complexion or losing your luster, I think they're talking about that. You suddenly get this kind of gray, lifeless, um, lack of vitality. Look. Second one is, in that realm, they're always comfortable. Right? They're like, uh, you know, always like, and suddenly, their body doesn't feel comfortable on, even in their seat. Right? They have these kind of like beautiful palace, palatial seats, like a um, fancy chair or something. And suddenly they can't be comfortable, right? You know how that, and again, if you've been with like, I remember, um, it makes me think of some elderly relatives who like, wherever they sat, they couldn't be comfortable. So I'm like that myself. <laughs> uh, also, they tend, to, the gods wear like, um, it's said that they wear flower garden garlands. It must be a little like Hawaii or something. Uh, and though the flowers in the god realm are always fresh and sweet smelling, and suddenly that being's flowers start to wilt. So suddenly it's like, you can see that sometimes in movies, like where some, you know, like, like a flower is very brilliant and suddenly it goes like, it's like all of a sudden it just goes, like so all of a sudden their flower gardens start to smell bad and no longer be. All about fresh. Hollywood. Yeah, it's kind all of, about Hollywood. Hollywood's a little like this. Isn't it? There's, and then it says, one's clothes become smelly or dirty. Like, so up to that point they didn't have to do laundry. Apparently, it's like one of the advantages of the God realm. You don't have to do laundry. Your clothes naturally stay sweet-smelling and fresh. and like, like Just laundry. Uh, and suddenly, your clothes start to smell bad and look dirty. And then the last of the five is that you start to sweat. Like, so again, your body starts to smell bad, is what it's saying. Like, in that realm, you know, like, they, they maybe they take showers for fun, like with celestial raiment or something, you know, celestial pork. But they don't have to be uh, in the sense of, like, we do, uh, but suddenly their bodies start to sweat and, and have a smell to them. Um, and the point being of all this, uh, one is, can you imagine that? Like, actually, I mean, your analogy of Hollywood is a little bit good, right? Because, like, the point being, like, this is, uh, in Hollywood, I think it's much worse for women than men. Uh, Hollywood's terrible that way, right? But, like, what was that thing, point? Uh, I, I said this earlier, it was, came earlier in the text. Imagine if you, where one Lama said, um, thank goodness aging happens gradually. Because if it happened overnight, it would be utterly horrifying and terrifying. But like, you know, if you imagine like being at a Hollywood party, right, and suddenly looking old and having a deathly pallor, right, like, they'd be like, get this person out of here, right, is it would be the, like, you, know, you, you belong somewhere else, right? please leave, right. Um, and the point being that in the God realm, this is the descriptions they give, is when those five signs come, the gods, basically they don't want to think about death. And they're ter they would be terrified if they thought about it because they're just caught up in, in pleasure. And so they spurn the person. Like, it's like they want that person, they want to send them to an old folks home or send them to the, 
send them to hospice, and I'm not going to come visit, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so the, suddenly the person who spent their entire life sort of in this sort of party, right, in a party atmosphere, a kind of pleasurable, with beings they thought were dear friends, suddenly nobody wants to see them. Uh, again, I'm just pausing and say this is kind of similar to the human realm, isn't it? In a certain way. Uh, that sometimes happens, doesn't it? Uh, because there's a denial of death, right? Not wanting to face death. So they, 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 they get spurned. And then um, they are terrified, right? In other words, if you imagine somebody who's only ever, they've never thought about anything. Part of the issue of the God realm is you don't think about issues of meaning. You don't think of issues of future lives. You don't think of issues of spirituality. You just party, right? Uh, you know, like, it's like being at a rock concert or something. Can you imagine, like, suddenly being, like, I don't know how to say it right. I'm going to use a metaphor here for a moment. Imagine you're, like, if you were, like, 23 at a rock concert, right? And suddenly you were 80 and shoved in the bathroom because nobody wanted to see you and you're dying. Right? That would be terrifying. I mean, that's my metaphor for a moment. Point being that the gods at that point are terrified, <laughs> uh, feel alone, feel confused, and horrified. And horrified at their own sudden transformation, right? Because they never thought about impermanence. And then comes the next suffering. Uh, so they go in order like that. So when that happens, then uh, Lama Sukhapa quotes Nagarjuna's friendly letter. It says, as they transmigrate from the world of the gods, in, the case, in case there is no remainder of anything virtuous, they change without control into situations of animals, hungry ghosts, and beings of hell. And now to elaborate on that a little bit, they say that the suffering of the gods at this time is worse than the sufferings of beings in the lowest in the hell realms. The point being, like, they see that when that happens, these things, the wilting and the pallor and the sort of their approaching death, they uh, are able to see where they're going next. Right? Uh, they have like a karmic trans uh, vision or a, what's it called, a clairvoyance, or a, they can see what's going to happen next in their next life. And so, like, they're alone, everybody has spurned them, they're suddenly losing all their power and wealth and all that, and they have a vision of their own future rebirth as an animal or a hell being or a hungry ghost, right? And, um, and, the, and again, so a couple points. One is, they say that uh, that suffering is the worst suffering, actually, of samsara in some way, or one of the worst sufferings of samsara. No, one of them, anyway. And you can see that, actually, right? Like, so if you, if you, if you, you know, even in the human realm, right? If you're there with somebody, like, when they lose all their money, right? like, when something happens, right, which happens often, like, I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I've known a number of people who, like, you know, had invested in something and it was a scam or had some, you know, things like that, right? Like, um, I'm going to say, right, it's like, I, I interpret it this way, like, the person has a certain identity, like, like their identity is, I'm this, right? I'm well off, or I'm comfortable, or I'm, you know, the same thing, right? Like, if you've been there with somebody who, like, especially if they're getting older, right? A person's getting older, and they think they have this, like, very wonderful marriage, right? And then one day, their partner says, um, I'm with somebody else, you know, I've been with somebody else for six months, I never told you, but I'm leaving, goodbye. There's a kind of suffering that happens at that moment, right? um, where it's like everything you thought you were and could have and were going to be for the rest of your life suddenly, in one moment, disappears and falls out from under you. You know, so sometimes it's well, sometimes it's your partner. Now that's that's mild compared to this, right? That, I mean, that's just at least then you still have the same body. You know, like you're, you're not, you're not uh, losing your body, and if you're losing your wealth, you may still have friends, and if you're losing your friends and partner, you may still have some money. Something, you know, at least you have one, or at least you have your house still, or something. Here, you lose everything all at once. Does that make sense? And, but it's like, to feel like you're up here, and then to feel like you're going to go down there, right? Um, and I'm just pausing, it's true, isn't it? Like, in other words, it's hard, the more you, I mean, even in the human realm, right? The, like, the more comfortable you are at a certain thing, then the more scary, like, the more scary it is to suddenly be thrust into some other socioeconomic situation or interpersonal situation. Um, so the suffering, so to imagine even a, a God who's been there for thousands and thousands of years, 
who all of a sudden, never having thought about it, suddenly their body is failing them, nobody wants to be around them, they're isolated, and they see becoming a pig or something, right? Like, uh, I, apparently, like you can imagine that just being utterly horrifying to them, right? And then suddenly so, you, they see, I have no way to escape that, I'm going to be a pig sty. So it's, it's kind of like the height of transmigration mm-hmm. in terms of scale of falling from. It's the biggest fall. <laughs> the yeah, biggest so big fall. It's the big fall. Actually, we're about to get to the only one that's bigger, <laughs> the next one. <laughs> but uh, it's the second, yeah. from the go- desire realm gods to the lower realms, is the second biggest fall in some sort. Um, so, so that's that. Oh, yeah, so Dr. Lauren, I had a question. So it says, um, actually you become animals, <clears throat> hungry ghosts, and hell, beings of hell. Is that true? Like, from God, you suddenly become an animal? It seems like counterintuitive in a sense because you became God in the first place because you have accumulated so much of merit. And now all of a sudden, mm-hmm. your downfall is like so huge. Well, one thing is that uh, <clears throat> not all gods go to the three lower realms. It's saying here most do. Some can fall to the human realm, but most fall to the lower realms. That's the idea. And the reason is it says in the first half, there is a remainder, uh, there's no remainder of anything virtuous. So the idea is that like the person in a past life created um, good karma, let's say through generosity, for example, right, in ethics. And so they took rebirth in the God realm. And the idea is that they, it's like, um, let's see, let's say this right. You know, that, that good karma was like a ball thrown up. Um, and the idea is that it keeps going up and up and up a ball until it runs out of um, momentum. Right. right. And then it starts to fall. And the idea here is that the person remains in the God realm until all their merit is used up, basically. Okay. And when they're about to die, they've used, they, their pleasures they've experienced. Whereas all the time when they're using that pleasure, it's like they've been um, using up their merit. So exhausting their and, merit. And then it's exhausted, and that's why they fall down. Um, and the, the, the God realms are really long periods of time. Yeah. Right, it's a really... Yeah, it's like thousands or millions of years. Right. So you cannot be a god and then be a Buddha, because they can't practice in that way. Exactly. Yeah, they don't practice because they're so caught up. You know, I sometimes say, um, if you imagine trying to practice there, it'd be like trying to, pr- that's why I give the analogy of a rock concert. Like, if you imagine, like, trying to practice, your, like, if you said, okay, I want to learn how to meditate, but you're at, like, a rock concert, and everybody's drunk and high, uh, you know, and it's bumping into you and dancing, you know, it's like, you couldn't do it. And there's a story, a famous story like that, where um, there was a student of, I think it was one of the Buddha's disciples, one of the monks, I think it might have been Shariputra, I'm not sure, but I think it was Shariputra, had a student, who was a do- I think a doctor, actually, who was very devoted, and then he created a lot of good karma. So his job was helping people who were sick, and then he was very devoted, so he would make offerings. Like, whenever Shariputra came, he would, like, prostrate and offer a nice seed and, like, make, offer him lunch and so on. And so he created a lot of good karma, both by helping others and by serving his teacher in that life. And then the story goes that he died, and he got reborn in the God realm. And then uh, Shariputra was able to go there. He was like a, he was an arhat, so he, could, he had magical power, so he could travel there. So the story goes, he went to the God realm to see. He knew, he knew oh, my student was died, and, and now he's reborn in the God realm. And so he went to the God realm to see his student. And that student in the human realm had always been so respectful and so on. And then he said, when Shariputra, his teacher, arrived, the, the being in the god realm now was sort of sporting with goddesses and drinking. And, and they said, uh, when he saw Shariputra, he just raised one, only his little pinky. Like, you, like, you know, like if you're really rich, like, and you see like your former poor friend, like, you might go like that. Mm-hmm. Like, they said that was all he could bother to do was to raise one pinky. Of, um, and so the point being, like, he had no, he was so absorbed in his pleasure, in a way that he uh, couldn't even acknowledge his teacher. And, and so he, was no, he had no interest in listening anymore. Like before, he would ask Shariputra advice and like, you know, sort of receive guidance and how do you live your life. And, but once he was in the God realm, it was like he was so absorbed that he couldn't have any interest in that. And that's taken as an example for what it's like in the God realm, where you're, there's no mental space. In a way. So the God realm is like, technically it's like totally delusion. Kind of having difficulty if you have all this merit, <clears throat> why would you go to such a place? Actually, if you think of like, I mean, think for a moment of like ordinary people, like most people, right? Like, actually, it's interesting, right? Like, most people, when they, I mean, if you think of like, because it's dedication, right? What do you dedicate for, right? And so, if you think about like, <clears throat> and again, it's not putting people down, but most people, like, 
if they do create good karma, right, what do they want, actually, right? Like, and again, I'm not trying to put anybody down, but like when people talk about like, you know, even the way, to be honest, I mean, I, I'm thinking of all different religions, descriptions, right? Um, for a moment, if, they, if you think of like what people, like, but people essentially, oftentimes people are dedicating, you know, may I be in a good place? May I be in a place where everything's wonderful and where I have everything I want? And even sometimes Buddhists who talk about the Pure Lands, you know, they don't, if you, sometimes if I talk to some Buddhist friends who, think, who describe, like, who want to go to the Pure Land, some, and some are different, but oftentimes the description is not, the focus isn't on, wow, I'll get to practice Dharma all the time, and there will be no distractions, I can just absorb myself in meditation. More of the description is like, oftentimes what you hear people say is like, oh, wow, they're like, you know, I read the description, there are these parks there, and there are these like, you know, whatever, there's celestial, whatever, you know, something like this and that. Um, depending on which Pure Land, they, they're focused on the, the descriptions of the pleasurable aspects of the Pure Land. And I guess my point is, is like, because we have so much desire, basically, we oftentimes, again, like, if you're a Buddhist and you're pious, you might say, may I be better than all sentient beings, and that's, you know, that's good, right? But I personally, I mean, if you think about, just answering your question, in people's hearts oftentimes, right, when they do something good, and I've known people, like, you know, they, like, there is, so somebody, there is, they want, in their heart, what they want is uh, the best, only better, <laughs> or something like that. You know, and so if the dedication is like that, that's one issue. The other is even if you look around, right, like, look in this world, right, at people who do gain great wealth, right? And, um, or even, you know, pretty good, moderate, you know, like, a uh, fair amount of wealth, and so on. Most people, actually, if you talk to many, many, most people, right, it's like their focus is on how am I going to invest it, what kind of car am I going to get, you know, where will I get, a, like, a vacation home, uh, can I have two vacation homes, like, you know, is the focus is that, right, like, I mean, how many people is their focus, oh, I've got great wealth, I can go do a long retreat now, uh, let me go into a three-year retreat, I have a great, oh, I've, I suddenly have a lot of wealth, let me go into a three-year retreat. Right. Even people who might have thought of doing a retreat, but if they're very well, they say, well, maybe it's not that important. I can, uh, you know, because now I can do whatever I want. Like, so I guess the point is, is like, you know, it's what people's minds are interested in, in a way, I think, is the issue. Um, so great merit, in a way, doesn't, what's well, really rare, right? First of all, it's rare to create good karma, but then it's even more rare to dedicate that, like, truly with bodhicitta. You know, so if you de if you de if you create merit and you dedicate with bodhicitta, you don't get stuck in the god realm. But otherwise, you do. In a way. So there, it gets back to your intent. Yeah. yeah, and if your intention isn't pure, like actually, there was this, there was some saying like, uh, I think in the section on dedication, it, uh, it was a commentary that said this. It said, it said, be careful how you dedicate. You know, because they were actually drawing the point that. If you're not careful how you dedicate, right, and it's like polluted, in a way, that's the word I would use. If your dedications are polluted or aren't clear, you know, then there's the danger that you get reborn as, and again, like, I'll, I'm just going to use a metaphor. You get born as, the, as the, the son of a dictator. Right? Like, um, so suddenly you have wealth, you have comfort, you have power, right? Um, I say son because oftentimes dictators want to pass it along to their son, like their daughter. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not even their daughter, but most dictators are megalomaniacal men who want to give power to their son. Um, that's a horrible rebirth, right? Like, or is you end up being raised with those kind of ideas, and you, you know, but but that's a result of merit in a way, right? Like, there was you create good karma in the past for wealth and power, but you didn't dedicate it—not you, but the person didn't dedicate with bodhicitta. Um, and that's analogous to the God realm. So the point being, like, if, if merit is dedicated with sincere compassion and love and with bodhicitta, with that kind, then, of course, it will never result in those kind of things. It results in a life of being of health. Um, but, like, impure or polluted dedication leads to, you know... And again, like, you know, how many being, how many people... If, I mean, first of all, how many people create good karma? Not that many. Maybe not, not many people are interested, but... Of those who do, how many are dedicated with bodhicitta and how many are saying, you know, if, they're, if they believe in past and future lives, may I have a good future life? If they don't, if they more are like a theist, right, may I go to heaven, not may I lead others. Like, 
I remember this. I was shocked. I'll just share a personal story for a moment. I was really shocked by this. My grandmother, when my my grandmother, when she was dying, I went to see her. Uh, I loved her very much, and um, and she said, I was I was really well. The first thing I was shocked by both things. The first thing she said to me was, she was suffering from liver cancer. She, she had terrible pain. Like she was in like that overwhelming physical pain. And the first thing she said that shocked me was she said, um, may my pain be a ransom for others. May no one else experience pain like this. May everyone who's loved me or known me or all my friends, everyone I've known, may, may they not have to suffer through my suffering. So I was already Buddhist and I thought, she's practicing Tong now, but we never talked about that because she's not Buddhist. You know, she never was interested in that. And then she said the thing that surprised me more even. She said, um, what she, she said, you know, I assumed, like, I thought, oh, I knew she kind of had some belief. She wasn't, like, a very religious person externally. So I thought she might, if anything, want to go to heaven. Or something. But she believed in God. And she said, um, she said to me, you know, may God send me wherever I can be of the most help. I don't care where it is, but wherever somebody needs help, may God send me there, because I want to help them, whoever that would be. And I thought, wow, like, that's a beautiful dedication, like, a beautiful dedication of her life, you know. But I was like, but almost nobody does that, right? Most people, if they, th if they have any belief, right, they say, may I go someplace good? You know, or may I go to heaven? Or may I have a good rebirth? Like, depending on their belief system, right? And so, like, um, from this point of view, that's problematic, right? Because even if they succeed, you know, like, I think of, like, some many good religious people who did create some good karma or good deeds in their life. But if their main prayer is, may I go someplace good, you know, well, I mean, they may get that result. Because right, that's their dedication, but that's not ultimately a satisfying. It's not an ultimately satisfying result. It's still better than the opposite. But is that? I don't know if that answers. It's okay. how you define happiness and pleasure. I mean, if if you're if you're defining pleasure as all these you know lack of problems and, and uh, all the sport and so forth, then that's you're right. That's what you get. So it's a, it's a much more subtle how you define what happiness actually is. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, I mean, I'll say one more point related to what Jeff just said, just following up on that. I, I mean, it's much more powerful than that. I mean, much, the, the thing with my grandma surprised me because she wasn't, I didn't know that. Well, I didn't know what was in her heart until she told me those things. But, um, but it was, I mean, I remember talking to Reber Imbache as he was approaching the end of his life. And, it, you know, he would say things like, you know, well, there will be a lot of problems and suffering to come, but we don't care about that. We're Dharma practitioners. We don't mind suffering. We don't mind difficulties. That's what, you know, because it's compassion. Like, we want to be there for others, right? Like, it's like, we want to practice compassion. So we embrace difficulties and hardships in order to be present for other beings, um, right? But most people, right, I remember when he said that, I felt scared. I was like, wow. It's like difficulties, hardships, and suffering sound scary a little bit, you know? Um, so he, he wasn't, he never dedicated in the slightest. In other words, he never, did, he never, I don't believe he ever once dedicated any merit, may I be comfortable, may I be happy, may I have what I want, only, right? All of his dedications were, may I be of love and service and compassion to others. And I think he was always blissed out because of that, but, um, but I guess my point is, yeah, like following on what Jeff's saying, even if we're not, like if we don't really understand what Dharma is, right, like deeply, then even if we're trying to practice Dharma, somewhere in our heart, our dedication is, may I not have problems, may I be comfortable, May everything kind of go my way, right? Um, which in a way is problematic, right? You know, from the point of view of dedication, right? Because even if we're saying, may I become enlightened, but if our idea of enlightenment is everything will be easy for me, uh, that's not really, you know, I mean, no, enlightenment is a kind of ease in a way, so it's not contradicting that, but, but if there's a kind of, what's the word? If, it's, if that's motivated mainly by a kind of self-centered avoidance of problems, um, and rather than love and compassion, the results may not be as entirely good. Right? Um, and again, it's not to say that ease is a bad thing, but you get my point there. It's like shallow pleasures versus deep pleasures. Right? Yeah. Enlightenment is, has depth to it. Yeah, and the more deeply we understand what enlightenment is, then when we say, may I become, I dedicate this to enlightenment, if we under, the more we understand what enlightenment is, the more we're, our, 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 medic, our dedication of our merits can actually bring that, right? Because if I say, may I become enlightened, but I don't, my idea of enlightenment is like laying on, 
you know, sort of some, you know, some spiritualized version of laying on the beach in the Caribbean or something, you know, then I'm saying a one word, but the meaning to me is something different. Yeah, so the ease is in a, an avoidance of discomfort. Yes. So in that sense, isn't that also samsara? Except it's not within one lifetime, but you're like, you know, you spend time in the God realm, and then you're saying you're back in the low, yeah. lower realm. So in some sense, you're <laughs> across, except it's across life. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Back, right. Yeah, they call it cyclic existence, right? The, sometimes, usually, the translation of samsara is cyclic existence. And, I mean, you can think of it like a washing machine or something. You know, it's like like a cycle, the spin cycle of a washing. You know, so we go up, we go down, we go up, we go down, and that's we cycle. And that's yeah. So you're right. It's like a machine that we cycle in over and over and over. Are you in the God realm? Because you're mindlessly pursuing um, desire and fulfillment of your desires, you are creating, in that realm, you are creating negative karmas, correct? Yeah. A boatload of negative karmas. So that's why, in general, you go down um, farther, because it's all about creating. You're creating nothing but negative karma, basically, for a million years. Right, and remember also it's the desire realm, right? So right. the God realm, you're mostly creating negative karma of desire, and then every now and then, like in the human realm, only more so, right? You're creating e like thousands of millions of years of negative karma of desire, and every now and then when the demigods attack, you create the negative karma of anger, right? right. Hatred, or of war. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's like a cycle, right? You're, only cre you're creating mostly desire, negative karma, every now and then anger, and we'll get to envy also, like jealousy. So... Yeah, they have afflictive emotions there, and so they're giving rise to all kinds of negative karma. And that took for a long time, right? Like, they don't live like us, they live like thousands of years. Yeah, that's right. It said that in the, uh, I can't remember the exact thousand. number, a million. <laughs> Millions of years. Uh, in the section on precious human rebirth, it gives it talks about the length of the lifetimes and the god realms, and they're very, very extent long. Right. Um, so, um, Dr. Lord, one one thing that I want to point out, whenever we say the word God, yeah. <clears throat> the connotation is like, you know, God, the, the picture that you get, the concept that you get for a God is like a God. And trying to relate to all the descriptions that we have here for God, it's kind of difficult to grasp, like, you know, as a human being. Well, that's why I was saying it may be a better, I was almost saying, uh, that's why I said with small g and like, you know, I don't know if, um, you know, if people have read like the, I think it's, it's an easier way to relate than the, is to think of um, some of the myths from, you know, I mean, uh, depending if you've read the myths of, whether it be from the Hindu tradition, from the Greco-Roman tradition, you know, from some of the um, other, like, pre, uh, what do you call it, you know, even actually, to be honest, even if you read the old, I mean, I, I think, honestly, my, this is my own, I'm sharing my own reflection for a moment. I think um, the New Testament, of the Bible is not helpful in terms of under, it's not relating to this very easily. Some of the stories in the Old Testament a bit are actually where they describe, you know, um, you know, basically conflicts between different divinities. You know, like actually in the Old Testament, there's some of that, but there's a lot of that in the, right, in the um, you know, if you if you read, uh, there are many different. I guess my point is is that you know, whether you, if you look at some passages from the Old Testament, if you look at the Greco-Roman myths, but also there, are, I'm trying to think of other ones like. Like Hinduism, there's always fight between Vishnu and Siva. Right, same idea. Same idea. And those would be listed as among, you know, like, so like they talk, some of the god realms described in Buddhism are the same as the ones described in Hinduism. So they'll talk about the, um, you know, they even talk about, you could, you could even be reborn as Brahma, for example. Right. Um, you know, you could have that rebirth. Um, and they talk about how you, what the causes are for rebirth as Brahma and things like that. So, um, and there are many, right? There's the god realm of the 33, and there's the god, so those are actually taken directly from the Hindu tradition. Oh. So if you read, um, actually, to be honest, sometimes in order to understand some of this, I was reading some of the Hindu Purana, Pur, uh, Puranas, I think you call them? Vedas. And the, yeah, the Vedas, the Puranas. The, and they describe some of the descriptions of these realms and what the beings there are like. Um, because I think it would fit with the Buddhist. That does fit. I mean, the Buddhist traditions are based on that, in a sense, in terms of their descriptions of those realms. I've seen a lot of mentioning of uh, Indra. I don't know in what aspect we use as a Buddhist. Indra. Mm -hmm. Indra was one yeah. of the gods, and then 
Vishnu and, and Brahma. So the concept of Brahma is like the whole cosmos. Brahma is the whole cosmos and so on and so forth. So I've seen a lot of references to that. Yeah, because the, the Buddha didn't contradict, you know, I mean, he was obviously living in India, and he didn't contradict those traditions. He just said, those don't lead to liberation, basically. If you were born as Brahma, he, he would say Brahma also is not liberated from samsara. Brahma is part of samsara. Vishnu is part of samsara. You know, so that's that kind of the Buddhist stance, is that those beings exist and are powerful and have, you know, great merit uh, to be reborn there. They, it was created by good karma, but it's not, it's still within samsara from the, from the Buddhist perspective. Oh. Okay, a few other points about the god realm, another of, the, of the, these uh, desire realm gods. Next point is that um, they, they also have uh, envy. So talking about how they create negative karma. So uh, Lama Sangapa points out, uh, and actually this is right, so the gods who already have great pleasure and great wealth and great power sometimes look and see gods who have more wealth and pleasure and power, and they feel jealous. Right? These are not jeal the jealous gods of the demigods, but they're saying even in the god realm, and that's true, isn't it? I mean, or as you can see, how that, that's basic samsaric psychology, right? There's always somebody with more, you know. And that's the problem, of, you know, it's, it, this is inherent to the desire realm, right? Within the desire realm, like, we're always capable of looking around and seeing someone who has more and thinking, why aren't I like them and why don't I have, I have what they have? Um, and because the problem desires is, can't be satisfied. Because, yeah, it's the nature of desire, exactly. Right. And that's why it says here, uh, you know, some have more extensive heaps of merit, right? Some have more positive karma from a past life, and therefore they have more pleasure. And, you know, you, you never, let's say it right, it's the problem of desire, you never win, right? Um, you never, you can never be satisfied. And so, of course, the gods also have a kind of envy of each other. Um, and again, you can relate that to the human realm, right? It's true, isn't it? Like, no matter how much you have, there's always somebody who has more, and you can feel jealous of them. Um, but you even see that between leaders of countries, right? Like, who has more power than between very rich people and, so, um, and very beautiful people, right? Like always somebody else more beautiful, right? It's always, you know, it's, it's just the problem. Whatever you have, there's always the insecurity if you're, if you're caught up in desire. And then the next point is um, the suffering of being chopped up, split, killed, and banished. And um, so there it says, uh, when the gods fight with demigods, they experience the suffering of having their limbs and their other body parts chopped off. Their suffering of their bodies being split and the suffering of being killed. And so here it's saying, um, in the nature, in the god realm, if you have your arm or your leg or your other, like a, you know, some other part of you chopped off, it eventually grows back in that realm. That's the nature of that kind of body. But if they chop off your head, you die. Uh, so if you if you get decapitated in the war of the in the war between the gods and the demigods, then you die in the god realm. Um, and then it's saying sometimes uh, in, in out of these wars, gods are banished. Again, it's kind of I mean, if you read the it's making me think of Zeus. You know, there are stories like that, right? Of uh, those kinds of uh, ancient stories, right? of gods being chopped up and of them being banished and being sent out somewhere else. And, um, and so it's basically saying that those kinds of sufferings are like in the human realm, right? war and conflict and being hurt. Uh, so it's not, again, it's not a pure happiness. Does that make sense? Um, and it's not a lasting happiness. And it's not a reliable happiness. And it's tainted by desire and by conflict and then eventually by death and falling back down. Um, it's always been unclear for me, and this makes it more unclear, why, uh, or what we're currently talking about makes it more unclear, what the, the real differentiation between God realm and demigod realm. I mean, what, they seem to have the same set of experiences, except in the demigod realm, less satisfaction, but that seems to be more of a continuum than sort of separate experiences. Yeah, the only, I mean, my, my own, just my own reading of that, uh, I'm not really sure, but I, I think um, the impression I get is that the primary, the primary experience in the God realm is pleasure, and then occasionally they have these conflicts and wars mm -hmm. and jealousies and things like that, whereas I think in the demigod realm, the, the, most, the most common experience is envy 
and sort of planning battle and sort of um, I would draw this analogy like within um, I'll use this is the way I think of it personally is like um, this is why I give the analogy like I, I moved here from California as you know I sort of sometimes thought this is just my own I, I, this is not a Buddhist teaching this is my own metaphor but <laughs> I sometimes thought like oh, okay like Santa Bar I moved from Santa Barbara I sometimes think Santa Barbara and certain parts of LA like Santa Monica are kind of like the God realm like in other words people's focus there my experience was is like you know hang out with my girlfriend and like then we're gonna go out for a really nice meal you know and like they're like wealth I'm talking about like wealthy wealthy attractive people you know and like I'm gonna hang out with like whatever you know, I'm gonna go hang out with a musician and go to a concert tonight and like you know are you going you know and like this kind of like there was kind of a focus on pleasure essentially and then when I got here I remember taught like meeting like again actually like meeting people who worked at the Pentagon for example now, they're also wealthy and human, you know, but, like, their focus is not, I was like, I was talking, not, not that they don't take a vacation every now and then, but mostly not, you know, like, <laughs> and, uh, and I was, like, talking to this people, I was like, oh, wow, like, they're wealthy and powerful, like, those people are wealthy and powerful, these people are wealthy, but the focus is more on, like, I don't know, like, you know, or somebody works at the CIA, or, the, you know, th these kind of jobs around here, where it's, like, the focus is not on, like, I'm going to go to the beach today, tomorrow I'll chill out and like hey you want to go on a bike ride it's like you know it's more about like power uh, and sort of work competition. and competition that's what competition and so to me that's a different it's like I take that that's just my own reflection personally as I sort of thought oh those beings are humans who are the analogy of the God realm these beings are humans who are the analogy of the demi God realm or anti God realm where it's like the focus is on competition not on enjoyment so you saw it as a step down is what you're saying Oh, I know it was a step down. <laughs> <laughs> so, so but that's okay, because as Dharma practitioners, we can break Sarchan. <laughs> that was appalling indeed. <laughs> well, Dr. Lawrence, uh, it almost comes to, uh, I'm just contemplating, so we're talking about collective karma of a place, like collective karma yeah. of California as opposed to collective karma. Yeah, I'm just using that as a metaphor, of course. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, so the collective karma of the God realm that's the point, though, is the, the collective karma of the God realm. So you can imagine that the God realms, so even when they describe them, it's kind of like, you know, they describe them basically like, you know, I don't know, so, some combination of a rock concert or the Caribbean or L.A., you know, on the Oscar night, you know, the parties there, like where they're giving you everything. For, and, whereas orgy. when they describe An orgy. What's that? An orgy. Yeah, or that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas when they describe the demigod realms, it really is more like, the descriptions are more like, you know, it's like Wall Street. Wall Street. It's people like plotting, yeah, and, and sort of how do I, you know, how do I get ahead? And those people are higher than me, but we're going to beat them. It's right, like right. Um, it's a description. So it's a different kind of. If they're different realms, how can they interact? Oh, like us, like it's like human and animal. Like we interact with animals, oh, okay. and they interact. Like so, there are certain realms that have more. You know, like every rare. Supposedly, there are rare humans who can see the gods and the demigods and the hell beings. But most humans can only see the animal realm, and I think there it's similar. So, the, the, like we have a lot of interaction with the animal realm, so they have a lot of interaction with each other. They dog, like where that's the nature of their realms is that they're sort of interactive, uh, and I guess like some god and, and some gods can see the human realm, but the most uh, the impression you get from reading the text is most of them have no interest. Like they're caught up in their pleasure, and they're like, oh, you know, it's like why would I want to look at that? You know, that's uh, yeah. So actually, the word asura. Translates uh, into half uh, half human being, half God, mm -hmm. Asura. So that, that's how it goes. So they have the the anger and envy from the human side, I guess, and then they want to reach mm -hmm. the higher planes of pleasure as the gods have, mm -hmm. along those lines. I guess that's where, like, uh, so, so that would be similar to the Greek Greek demigods. Yeah. You know, it's like the same similar idea. And, uh, oh, so we'll cover one more. So then um, next, Lama Sankaba changed. So he's saying, that is important, right? So there are two types of God realms. One is the desire realm gods. We just covered that. So that's the end of that section. Um, gods who are in the desire realm. Then Lama Sankaba says, there's another kind of suffering of the gods who he says here are in the uppermost realms. That's the next section. So they're not in the desire realm. They're in the form or the formless realms, um, which are not part of the desire realm. And so there are um, four form realms and four formless realms. 
Um, and so then he says, although the gods in the two uppermost realms do not have the suffering of suffering, they have mental afflictions, they have obscurations, they lack control over their death, transmigration, and next state, which is why they suffer through taking on bad states. So what this is saying is that, this is an important point, so the, the, those beings who are reborn in the form and formless realm, it's another kind of divine existence, but it's not in the desire realm. And, and the point being this, is that in order to be reborn there, the other kind, to become a desire realm god, the cause of that is good karma of like generosity, uh, ethics, helping other people, and so on. Right? And then you dedicate it for good rebirth, and you can take rebirth in the desire realm god. The cause of rebirth in these uppermost realms is meditative <coughs> absorption. Or is it, it's these kind of, um, in, as in the, you would, in the human realm in this case, uh, develop uh, single-pointed concentration, you would develop calm abiding, and then you would actually enter these states of these other realms as a human being. So you would enter, like you would develop, so the person to do that has to first develop calm abiding. And then after developing calm abiding where you can completely absorb your mind um, on a meditative object with a kind of, they call it bliss and pliancy, so this kind of very uh, flexible, light uh, capacity to uh, make your mind uh, serviceable and focused on any object that you want. In these cases, you don't, you, the person who's going to end up in the uppermost realms, in these God realms, they don't use that ability to meditate on emptiness, on the ultimate nature of reality, because they don't know what emptiness is, they never learned it, they never studied it, or they never took an interest in that. And so they use that, like, basically the idea is this, is that, I'll just share this, because it's understand this, I think you have to understand that. The idea is, so somebody who has gained, I'll actually share this point. So um, as a person's progressing towards calm abiding, what happens um, is that they start to experience a kind of pleasure that's not a desire-driven pleasure. It's a different kind of pleasure. Um, it's the pleasure of meditation itself. And, um, or bliss, they sometimes describe it as. But again, it's not like the bliss of, and, you know, we have, all of our experiences of bliss are ordinary people, like who haven't developed calm abiding, right, in this life, or don't have that. Our experiences of bliss are usually based on sensory experiences, right? So you could say, like, oh, I had this, whatever, like, whether it's, um, you know, whatever sexual uh, pleasure or food or being someplace beautiful, like, you know, ascetic pleasure, um, you know, seeing or hearing something, right, music or, uh, you know, so it's, it's sensory, right? Uh, in this case, it's not sensory, right? So the person who's developed calm, who's developing even close to calm abiding, uh, they develop more and more a kind of sense of intense or powerful experience of bliss or pleasure that's not sensory, it's based on the experience of meditation itself. And there's also a kind of quality of that where what happens is as you develop these more and more absorbed states of meditation, there's also a kind of blissfulness in the sense that rough, gross states of mind are temporarily suppressed by the power of your meditation. And so also like experiences like jealousy and pride and desire and anger are also kind of temporarily suppressed. You know, because you're so absorbed in the meditation that those states temporarily kind of are, they're not, they don't cease permanently, but you're so focused on, in your meditation that those kind of are temporarily stopped, or, yeah, temporarily suppressed. And that also gives rise to a kind of pleasure. Does that make sense? A pleasure of peace, in a way. And so somebody, so in this case, the person who's developing higher and higher levels of concentration they reach a point after achieving calm abiding where they look at, this, at the whole desire realm, right? all these pleasures of the desire realm, and they realize experientially now, not just intellectually, but they realize experientially, wow, the pleasure of the kind of absorption in meditation is more pleasurable than any of those pleasures of, desi of desire. Right? And so they're still motivated by a wish for their own pleasant experience, right? But they sort of say, yeah, who wants a lower pleasure this is not the pleasure of enlightenment now, right? But just the pleasure of meditation. If I can have a more pleasant experience, right? And so they reach a point where eventually they, uh, they renounce the desire realm itself. And they say, I'd rather experience the form realm. That seems better. 
and they enter into the first absorption of the form realm. And then they kind of abide there, and they're like, wow, this is more pleasant than that. I don't want to go back there. And they meditate more and more, right? And then now there are different things a person can do. They can just stay in that first level of, of the form realm. Then some beings in that first level realize, oh, there's even a deeper, like more absorbed, more uh, subtle kind of state that's even beyond this, and that's the second level of the form realm. And then they go, and then they say, who wants to be in the desire realm or the first level of the form realm? I'd rather be in the second level of it. Does that make sense? Kind of. So and it's these this states is a of human. This is a human meditator. Yeah. At a certain phase. Yeah. Right. So. There is no death and rebirth into this form realm or formless realm. Not at this point, no. They're just experiencing it in their meditation. It's like they'd be sitting there. You know, you'd look at their body and you'd see them like this, totally silent. And right. Violent. But their subjective experience is that. So in addition to that, there's also <clears throat> the death and being reborn into one of these realms. Oh, which is what I'm getting to, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what I was, what I was getting to is that... Um, so, then, and so they might go through all, they might stay at any given level of the form realm, or they might go to a higher level of the form realm. Or some then go, some reach a point where they get to the highest level of the form realm, and they realize there's something even more subtle than that. Because they still have a kind of form at that point. They still experience uh, form or physicality at that point. Not their, bo not their gross body, but a kind of subtle level of form. Then there are some who reach a level where they say, I want to go beyond that. Right? And through meditation, they can enter into a meditation on infinite space where there's no form, no experience of form at all, just an experience of spaciousness. Does that make sense? And so they can go enter into these different meditative states. That's the basic thing. Now to get to Jeff's point, what happens is if the person has achieved some, any one of those eight, there are four form and four formless absorptions. If in the human realm a person has achieved any of those levels of meditation, um, then it's, they can, through that cause, it's a karma, right? It's a kind of, kind of karma. Through that cause, at the time of death, they can be reborn in that realm as a god who just lives in that realm. So they can live in, you know, so they die in the human realm at that point. And through the karma, now it's not a karma of generosity, it's not a karma of, it's a karma of meditation. Does that make sense? So through the power of their meditation at the time of death, they can be reborn in one of these meditative absorption realms. Are, are you referring to stream enterers, once returner? No, this is no. not like that. Not like a stream enterer is uh has realized emptiness so or you know once returner or non-returner those are beings who have realized emptiness um in the human realm and so then they have only that many times like like a once returner has one more right. life of samsara and so on this is not that this is a being a samsaric a totally samsaric being who's not realized the just ultimate absorption truth. in the form with full form, and full form exactly yeah just through that so you're talking about nine levels of uh Single-pointed. Yeah, so they progress through all nine levels, and then they, after that, they achieved one of these realms, one of these experiences in the human realm, and through the power of that, at the time of death, they take birth as a god in a realm like that. So it's reason, not a desire. Is there any reason for them to leave that state? Well, that's what we get to here. So what Lama Sokap is saying is, they just stay in that state, right, during that lifetime, but they're still, this is what Lama Sokap, now we can make sense of what Lama Sokap is saying here. He says, so they don't have the suffering of suffering. That's the first point he's making. He says, they don't have, they don't, you know, they don't skin their knee, right? And they don't get headaches, and they don't get backaches, and they don't um, have financial problems, you know, because they're in a realm that's not about that, right? And even like the God realm, where they have a body that's sort of interacting and having sensory pleasures, they're not interested in sensory pleasures. <laughs> so they don't have the kind of gross experiences of suffering that the Zion realm has. Right? That's his first point. He says, because they're in a meditative state, right, in those realms, they don't have the suffering of suffering. He says, but they do now have mental afflictions, they have obscurations, and they lack control over their death, right? So they still have the, what he's saying there is that they still have mental afflictions, right, and obscurations, and they still have the suffering of, the all-pervasive suffering of compounding, of the compounding aggregates, right? Um, transmigration and next birth. So what he's saying is, again, we'll get to it in a minute, but the analogy he's given is like, you get to that state through the force of previous meditation, again, like a ball being thrown up in the air. Right? That ball won't stay in the air. It's eventually going to fall down. And the point being here, those beings um, aren't free, first of all, from samsara, because they haven't realized the nature of reality. And so they experience these very subtle, pleasurable states for a lifetime. A, whole, a long lifetime. 
but because they still have the seeds, of, and, and so they both they still have mental afflictions, and they still have the seeds of mental afflictions in their continuum of being, um, and they don't have control, right? They, they, they're still under the control of ignorance uh, and of afflictive emotions and of karma, right? And it's karma that threw them there, right? And when that karma runs out, the previous seeds of their mental afflictions will become manifest again. And then they don't have control. They'll be thrown to some other realm. Uh, and I'll, I'll read this poem here. It's very short. I'll just read this brief line uh, from that Lama Sankapa quotes from a discourse on the collection. He says, One in the form or formless realms, having transcended the suffering of suffering, master of the bliss of samadhi. So samadhi is single-pointed concentration, right? So they've mastered the bliss of single-pointed concentration, who stays immovable for, immovable for eons. So it's saying they can stay there for a very long time, for eons is still not certainly freed at all. He or she will still fall from there again. If he or she has emerged somewhere beyond the whirlpool of pain of the bad realms, even with effort, he won't long last there. Now he gives two metaphors. He says, like a bird in flight high up. Right? So what he's saying is, no matter how, how high a bird flies, it eventually has to come down. Uh, I mean, right? In other words, birds can't stay in the air forever. They have in other words, to eat, to drink, uh, and to they eventually land. Then he's saying, or like an arrow shot by a child. Right? So he's saying, and you can imagine the metaphor there, right? A child shoots an arrow up, right? And they watch it go up and up and up. They're like, you know, actually, I'll excuse you. I, I, have you ever done this? Like, I remember as a kid, like uh, having a helium balloon, right? And sending it up in the air, and it would seem like it would go up forever, right? But of course, then it pollutes some poor, some poor person's. Uh, Yard or there, like you know, or some pond or some tree, right? Ends up with a deflated balloon. Um, so it's saying it's like that, right? Uh, it goes up, but it, it's, it goes up by through the force of you know, some temporary helium or through the child pulling the bow, but it's going to come back down. So then it says w that one also ends up falling. Then it makes another point, which is interesting. It says. Like butter lamps that blaze for long while actually perishing moment by moment, he is completely oppressed through suffering called compounding through thoroughly changing. What it's saying there is that the being in that realm, this is a, and, and I want you to just elaborate a little bit on this point. This is a, actually, uh, I said that earlier, We I, somebody said, oh, it's the, the fall from the desire realm God state is the worst of all. I said, the second worst. This is the worst, actually. Because the person in this realm because they stay there for eons and they experience a kind of bliss of meditation, oftentimes in the other texts it describes this, they think they've achieved liberation, actually. Mm -hmm. So that they think, I'm free from samsara. You know, you can imagine that, because they feel like, this is blissful, I don't have any of that suffering of, like, you know, I, I no longer have, like, aging. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm getting old. I don't feel like I'm getting sick. I don't have conflicts with anybody. It's not possible. I never get angry. I never get, like, that's the, I'm just, I'm just so the metaphor. But I mean, it was, my point is, is that they don't have those kind of experiences. And so they sort of have a, oftentimes a belief, this must be liberation from samsara. I must be enlightened. And, um, and then, uh, but what he says here, this is the tragic part, is, you know, when somebody lights a candle, a butter lamp or a candle, right? Um, we notice, of course, eventually the candle will burn out, right? And it's, like it goes, you know, but the whole time the candle's burning, it's using up the wax, right? And we don't often notice that. Like if you're watching a candle burn at a certain time, you don't think, oh, if it's like only a quarter of the way into burning, you don't think, oh, it's gonna, it's a quarter of the way done, and it's burning up. The, you know, you just enjoy the flame, right? And that's what he's saying here, in a sense, is that those beings, while they're enjoying the sort of bliss of samadhi, they don't realize it. But the energy that put them there is gradually being used up, right, moment by moment. And they don't see that. Right? But, um, but it's the reality, is that the force that put them in that good state, each moment that they're there is being used up. Um, that, that is true for us, too, for the dharma practice in samsara, correct? Ex well, then, except the difference is we're creating new, if we're really practicing dharma, we're creating new causes. Yeah. For good, whereas they're not. Exactly. They're just using up. Like, in other words, if you're if you're actually practicing dharma, you know, sometimes butter lamps are a good metaphor for this. If you ever go, like, sometimes in a monastery in uh, 
Nepal or India, you can see where the butter lamp's burning, but there's a monk who pours more butter into the lamp. So that's like, if you're practicing Dharma, you're like that, right? Oh. So the, the lamp is burning, but somebody's pouring more butter in. Oh, Whereas in this case, there is nobody to pour more butter, because you think you're liberated, right? And you think you're enlightened, so you're just kind of like... Yeah. I sometimes think, my own metaphor for this, when I meditate on it, actually, is like, if you imagine a person who has like... Imagine somebody... Sa- actually, there are people who do this, right? Somebody like worked, and they saved up $50,000. Imagine that for a moment. And then they say, and they're like in their 30s. Right? And they say, wow, I have a lot of money now. I'm just going to quit my job and I'm going to go to like the Florida Keys or the Caribbean or Hawaii. And I'm just going to like stay in a hotel and just enjoy my life. I'm set. Right? Like, and they're 34. Right? Like if you step back and you go, well, <laughs> Hawaii's not that cheap. You know, I'll use Hawaii as an example, right? You, you kind of be a, like, if I'm looking at that, I'd be saying, wow, like, you might make it two years. You know, like, like, then you're going to be homeless. You know, you quit your job, and two years out of quitting your job, you may not be able to get a job. Like, you may have a real problem in two or three years, you know. But that person would say, no, I got $50,000. I'm good, man. Like, bye. Um, and they might enjoy the time there, but if you look at them, you might say, wow, what are they going to do in three years? You know, when they're out of money. It's a bit like that. Just my metaphor for that. Um, and so, uh, oh, I'll make one more point. Then. So the point, though, is this: is uh, it doesn't say Lama Sangam doesn't expound on this here, but in the commentary sometimes it says this point that um, imagine thinking you've achieved liberation, you think you're enlightened, right? and then when that lifetime ends, it's worse than when the flowers wilt and the power powder comes, right? Because you thought you were enlightened, you know, and then you see. They have the same karmic vision. They can see where they're going to go next, right? So they're in like this formless absorption, for example, blissed out for an eon or something. And then suddenly they see, not only am I not enlightened, but I'm about to fall to a hungry ghost realm or something. And the horror of that, they say that the person then loses any, like, um, they oftentimes like lose any faith that there is such a thing as enlightenment. They lose faith in themselves. They lose faith in everything. And they're like utterly horrified because suddenly they're like dragged back you know, from the most blissful, kind of su- sublime and very refined state to the gross suffering of the lower realms or of, samsara, of, of ordinary, the rest of samsara. And they say that that suffering is actually even worse than the suffering of the gods, the desire realm gods, because it's a more refined pleasure, in a way. And it's a more, <coughs> you know, um, it'd be like, you know, I don't say it right, it's like a, yeah, a more subtle and refined pleasure, so it's even more disturbing. Um, and I'll just make one more last comment. There are actually uh, people like that. I'll, I'll say, I mean, that's this is over the course of lifetimes. But actually, there are people who achieve a certain level of meditative experience and think they're enlightened. It often happens. It happened more in California than given <laughs> You don't hear people like that in Virginia too much or Washington, but in California you hear people like that sometimes. Where somebody has it, they do meditate. In other words, it's true. In other words, they do meditate, right? They're a meditation practitioner, and they have like a blissful experience, and then they say, I'm enlightened. You know, and uh, I've had people, and like, I've, I've been with some of them, and I've had friends, and hear about, you know, tell me their friends, and that, you know, and, uh, you know, and then they describe what the experience is, and it's like, well, you can, if you study Buddhism, you say, well, that's not what Buddhism calls enlightenment. That you just had a, a temp- very temporary experience of something like an absorption, you know, but. <laughs> or, I'll make one more point about that which made me laugh to remember this Bob Thurman it's been in some book or tape I can't remember where but he pointed out that early in his life Lama Tsongkhapa had some experiences like he would meditate he would sit down to meditate and he would enter into these absorption states where he would experience like you know, kind of non-conceptual bliss but not emptiness yet and, um, and Bob Thurman made this point he said you know if he were living in America he would probably have like started advertising at that point you know, like, you know, <laughs> like, come sit with me and learn how to, you know, like, and only for only five hundred dollars per weekend or something, you know, whatever. Um, some kind of funny. He made a joke like that, but um, the point being that when Lama Tsongkhapa had those experiences, he did what a proper Buddhist practitioner does, which is say, you know, you know, all right, back to my studies and back to my practice, and how do I keep progressing on the path? That's just a side effect of meditation. That's not liberation. Liberation is the recog- is Buddhahood itself, right? Um, and so he had studied enough to understand what those experiences were and not overvalue them. But the problem is that, is that if we don't, if we haven't understood that, then if you meditate, you can get caught up 
in these other states and see them as like ends in themselves in a way. And then you end up taking a very long detour from the process of enlightenment. And those meditative absorptions, a couple of things. One is, um, one is from a Buddhist point of view, a couple of points. One is meditative absorption is useful as a basis for meditating on emptiness. Otherwise, it's not particularly useful, is one point. Uh, a second point is, bodhisattvas in particular um, have the practice of, through their compassion, they, or is, uh, you can imagine this, because those states are so pleasurable, right? But the bodhisattva, part of their practice is that their compassion is so strong that they can enter those states and then leave them. And they don't, they don't become attached to them because those are not one only, or is the bodhisattvas only enter those states to understand them to help other beings in those states. Does that make sense? Bodhisattvas don't enter those states for their own pleasure because the bodhisattva path isn't about, you know, sort of my own pleasure separate from others. Right? Uh, from a bodhisattva, the practice is how do I practice compassion for others and be of service to others and lead others to enlightenment? And that a Buddha has to know about all states of existence in order to fr free beings from those states, right? So bodhisattvas sort of can enter and leave those meditative states um, without becoming attached to them. And that's, in a way, that's the Mahayana practice. It's not to become attached to those meditative states as ends in and of themselves because they're not ends in and of themselves. They're just pleasurable meditative experiences that don't, don't, that in the, that don't lead to liberation in and of themselves. What leads to liberation is, is having meditative absorption focused on the ultimate nature of reality. So I want to explain that part. Well, then, Jeff, did you have? So these are, um, these are still samsaric states, states yeah. that are short of nirvana, much less enlightenment, right? right. Yeah. Um, oh, it's not nirvana? These are not nirvana. Nirvana is like when a person has achieved their own liberation from samsara. And through they're out of samsara at that point. Yes. So what level is the... Sometimes they say this, like that these, um, actually this is an interesting term, the, the, uh, you know I said there are four form realm absorption and four formless realm absorptions, so what they say is that the highest of the four formless, that's the highest, it's like, it, you know, if you, like this is the desire realm, then there's the first form, second form, third, fourth form, then the first form, the second form, you know, it's a metaphor, you don't really have form, but third, and then the top of all the formless absorptions, one way they label that one is the peak of samsaric existence. They say that's the very top, the most, that's the most subtle, most free, but you're still in some sort the most free from suffering, in other words, of suffering, the most free from any gross minds. But they say that one is the peak of samsara, so you're still in samsara. So nirvana is where the person has moved beyond that. They have to, it has to be beyond that state, is one way of saying it. That can still be stuck in absorption short of enlightenment. Right. I mean, the, I see what you're, you're the, saying. Like, the state of nirvana is still a state that can be experienced as a certain level of pleasure, which one could stay in unless there's a propulsion into enlightenment. Well, one point with that uh, is that um, why don't we start to differentiate two different questions? So, first of all, to your question is like that. Um, Nirvana is beyond samsara. Right? And so any of these states, including the highest of the formless absorptions and all the form, those are all still within samsara. According to, that's what Lama Sankapa is saying here. Is you're still not under control of your own rebirth at that point. You still take rebirth through the power of karma and um, afflictive emotions. And therefore, they're still within samsara. Whereas nirvana is beyond samsara, and you no longer take rebirth through the power of karma or afflictive emotions, and you no longer have any. So nirvana is a state where you no longer have any afflictive emotions and you never will have them again. So in these states, you've temporarily suppressed the afflictive emotions, but you still have the uh, ability to give rise to them, and you eventually will again. Whereas in nirvana, you've had a cessation. That's really the, the meaning, of, and one way of describing the meaning of nirvana is that you've had a cessation, permanent cessation, of the afflictive emotions, and they will not come back. Um, now what you're getting at, Jeff, is a different point than... Right, and I, I, we don't need to go there, actually. But, yeah, so in, this, in these uh, realms, death is basically karmic length of life. Yeah. There's no other cause that can be 
the cause of the death from one of those realms. Right? I don't think so. I've never heard of another cause. That's the only one. I mean, and in these stories, like you, like the the arrow shot up by a child or the flight of the bird. And the, to me, that implies like it's like sort of a, an exhaustion of the karma. So in the these, there is no danger of getting stuck in that realm. How do you mean? The pleasure of being in this in, in this absorbed state while intense and there's no reason to move, there's still no danger of being stuck there because your life span will end. Yeah, it will end. Well, the only distinction I was making on the nirvana side was you can get stuck at that level of nirvana endlessly because there is no cessation unless something else propels you beyond that state, the subtle obscuration part, right? That's all I was trying to get. Oh, I get it. And part of that, part of why I hesitate with yours, is that your point is, my understanding of that is that um, different Buddhist philosophical schools answer that, would answer that question very differently. So right, that right. the, um, especially the two Hinayana uh, philosophical schools answer that differently than the Mahayana schools. And then within the Mahayana schools, um, one of the mind only school, like, so uh, there was the Majamaka school in particular, your, answer, your, your question implies a Majamaka perspective. Correct. Because even, even, uh, so do I say it? even one of Asanga's texts, for example, so even some of the mind-only school practitioners would say that uh, that individual liberation in nirvana is permanent. Uh, it's not there, you don't move beyond it. Whereas the Majamaka school says you do. You know, it's like a, so it's a, just a philosophical difference of so different Buddhist schools. So, like the, um, so some schools would say, that is per, that is your final end uh, of your. In other words, you don't go beyond that. You just stay in that nirvana, individual nirvana. Whereas, like uh, Chandra Kirti's position would be, what you're saying, which is no, the Buddhas come and wake you up and say you have to. Become which a is which is where the bodhisattva, bodhisattva principle actually gets activated, right? I mean, until then, it's all for individual liberation. It's only at that point, from the Madhyamika point of view, that actually you become a bodhisattva. Yeah, for that person, that's true. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting, though, that the different philosophical schools sort of t have a different take on that. But, so, but yeah, you were asking from the Majamaka so, perspective. So, Dr. Lauren, so I thought uh -huh. Bodhisattva was a concept that goes parallelly as you go along with all these um, meditation and absorption and so on and so forth. So are you saying realization of Bodhicitta is not possible <coughs> unless you have hit that four form and four formless? No, no, no. What, what, what this is like, so uh, those two different things. Like so, one is um, a person. You don't have to have achieved any. Uh, you don't have to have achieved uh, the form or formless realm absorptions to become a bodhisattva right. and realize bodhicitta. You can realize those while in the desire realm. Right. You know, remember the Buddha that realized bodhicitta from a hell realm uh, right. in the past life. You know, when he first realized bodhicitta, he had been in the hell realms actually. So the bodhicitta can be realized. I mean, usually it's in the human realm, but occasionally it can be in other realms. Um, but then, uh, and, and beings also can be in the form or formless realms without any bodhicitta at all, right? Like, so right. somebody who just selfishly wants to be happy and they meditate to achieve their own happiness, you know, so they can go there and then they'll, but then they kind of, uh, that's the person who then kind of takes a rebirth there through that. So I was just saying earlier that on the other hand, if somebody already has realized bodhicitta, then they can enter those realms out of bodhicitta motivation, or is trying to understand the nature of different people, different right. kinds of beings experience. So, that you, but uh, but you don't have to. But so, um, non bodhisattvas can go to those realms, and bodhisattvas can go to those realms. So it's two different. Yeah, either one. But does that answer you? So one final question about this. So there are the demigod realms and the god realms, and there are the formless realms, and then there are the pure lands. And the pure lands are what in relation to these two sets of concepts. Uh, my understanding of that is that, like, one analogy that was given, which I thought was an interesting analogy, like, so take the example of, um, I think of the example of uh, Tushita Pure Land, like Gandum, uh, Tushita Pure Land, Tibetan it's Gandum and Sanskrit mm -hmm. Tushita. What they actually said is that, uh, <laughs> the analogy I, I got, which it was that, um, that, that that Pure Realm is part of a God Realm, actually, but it's a, it's like a separate, it, like the analogy they gave is the, if you went, the analogy was this, was if you went to India, for example, um, India's India, right? 
But then, um, if you visit Dharamsala while the Dalai Lama and all the other Lamas are there, <clears throat> that's part of India, but it's a unique experience that's quite different from being somewhere else if you're with the Dalai Lama. You know, if you're sort of part of that assembly. And so the idea is that um, it's like, the analogy I heard in that sense was that um, there's like a God realm, but then there's a section of it that's kind of uh, <coughs> ruled by, in this right now, uh, Maitreya. Uh, you know, in Tushita, purely. So it's kind of a subsection uh, that only that, you know, most beings don't get to go to. Like, the other, most of the beings in that God realm would have no interest in that and don't go. Uh, so I'm using my analogy earlier, like the Dharma Center in Los Angeles or something. I don't know. I'm joking. But um, it's like a Dharma Center. Is that section samsaric or non-samsaric? So you're in a God realm, which is samsaric. Yeah. This is a pure land where you're there to receive teachings based on karmic... Um, Credits, yeah, right. Is that a samsaric space or not? I've asked this question before. It's yeah, always yeah. I've been asking it for years. It's never quite clear what the yeah, and I don't like. Not the I've heard word. different things, and that's not totally clear to me either. To be honest, because the reason why it's not totally clear to me is, in one sense, I guess it depends how you look at it or something. Because like. To call it, this is my struggle with that question, so I don't know, like I'll just say my own struggle with the question anyway, is since in one way a pure land is created through the compassion of the Buddha, to say it's impure seems fun. <laughs> On the other hand, if the person who was reborn there at that time still has afflictive emotions, to say it's not in samsara seems funny because that person's still in samsara. Um, but to me, I'll, I'll just come back this way. Like, if I, I, I would say this. Oh, you still ahead. have to receive te teachings. So the reason you're going there is to receive teachings. The reason you're receiving teachings is you still have progress to make. Yeah. Which then presumes that you're still in samsara. Okay. Seems that way. Yeah. I'm sorry. I interrupted. Yeah. No, that's right. Question. Yeah. So, um, since I don't want to go to the God and then the God realm, we don't want to be right. there. But we get there because we're accumulating good karma. Um, does that imply then that we should... <laughs> we so should stop creating good karma. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that we should try and manage our <laughs> accumulation. How does that... No, you, yeah, I can explain that. That's easy. Yeah, I can get that. So, uh, Ketcher in the, in the uh, Easy Path book, he, he says that he gives it in a point where he says, he says, when you create good karma, it's like, um, it's as if you were, he gives a metaphor. He says, it's as if you were creating gold. And then he says, um, it's not enough. He says, first of all, so the more good karma you create, the better. Right? It's like a wealth of gold. But then he gives a metaphor. He says, if you don't dedicate it, though, if you don't dedicate the merit you create, then there's a problem. And then he, he gives a funny point. He says, um, he says, because if you don't dedicate, you have gold. And then he says, but if you dedicate it one way, carefully, you can have a golden Buddha statue, right? And you can add to that, like you're creating a, a, a like imagine you're creating an altar of golden Buddha statues, right? With many beautiful statues on it. That's like creating, if you dedicate the merit towards Buddhahood with Bodhicitta, it's like you, the more merit you create, the more beauty of that. Then he says, if you don't dedicate your merit carefully or correctly, he says that you may end up with a golden toilet, which I love the green metaphor. <laughs> and he says, you know, it's still gold, but it's just a toilet, you know, and you're just going to create poop, you know, or something like that. And, um, and so the point there is that you can create, um, the idea of, the, of practice and the suggestion is create as much good karma as possible, but always dedicate it with bodhicitta. And if you dedicate it with bodhicitta, then all that merit is becoming the cause of your future buddhahood. Whereas if you don't dedicate it carefully, then it can become the cause of a golden toilet. You know, which is his metaphor, for, and he's kind of joking, but it's basically saying like a god realm, or like being the dictator's son, or like being a, you know, some other waste of merit. You know? And so the idea is each time we create good karma, and so that's why Ken Shri points out, um, at the beginning, create the good motivation. You know, in the middle, do good actions, and in the end, dedicate each action. You know, so we can even do that throughout our day, like in the morning, 
you know, you might create, like, and then for work, you might say, okay, I'm going to create good motivation. And at the end of the day, I dedicate that to the Buddhahood. Then when I come home and do my practice, I, again, generate bodhicitta, do the practice, and then dedicate it to Buddhahood. If I help somebody else, then dedicate it to Buddhahood. And the more we dedicate it to enlightenment and to the benefit of others, you know, then it's like creating all the causes. And we need many, many causes for enlightenment. But so that's the key, is that then you make them the causes of enlightenment rather than the causes of further samsaric drama. Or something. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's good. So coming back to the meditative absorption, I, I just wanted to share something that I read, and uh, maybe you can comment on this. Kalu Rinpoche, who was the teacher for one of the teacher for Dalai Lama, uh, in his speech in UVA, I think it was 1970s or 80s. He was here for a while. He he mentioned a funny thing. Uh, um, so one of the causes of being a crocodile or a crane uh, could be one of the the meditative. Uh, states where you are lost, right. Right? like you think you're doing, like the one that you said about, example about California. So, so what he was saying is that a lot of people who get lost like that and then reborn as a crane or as a crocodile. Hmm. And just to, actually, I'll say, so we'll cover more about that particular topic in Lama Sankapa's section on calm abiding itself. Because one thing that's important, like, um, I think what he was probably talking about is Lama Sankapa makes a point in, in the section on calm abiding in this text, which we'll get to, where he kind of says, there's two different issues. One is when you've actually achieved calm abiding, like actual fully fledged calm abiding. Um, but then there, before that, in the nine levels approaching that, there are some levels where it's like, uh, one, one, one time I like this, this one person said, there's a certain level of what they call it stupid meditation, I think is one translation I'd like. But it's a state where you can, your mind becomes, it's a danger of meditation, which we'll get to again more, but it's a state where your mind becomes like calm and somewhat peaceful, <clears throat> but it's a, it's a mistaken meditation where you're not, in order to get to actual calm abiding, there has to be a vividness and a kind of um, a, acute awareness, a deep, or a, power, a kind of, almost a brightness to the mind, you could say, a, a kind of brightness to the awareness. <clears throat> there are some subtle they call it subtle sinking. It's like a meditative state where the two obstacles to meditation is too much excitement and too much dullness or sinking. At the beginning, it's dull, at the beginning, of course, it's like the dullness is I fall asleep and the excitement is I'm like my mind's racing around talking, thinking about. It. But there are very subtle levels of that, and the very subtle level of sinking is not yet calm abiding. It's a state where your mind actually doesn't get distracted anymore, but isn't vivid and isn't really aware, and so it's a kind of dull but calm state. And Lama Sankapa himself says, actually, that if you, sometimes meditators find that very peaceful and they just don't go past it. They don't get to that. It's like one of the level, you know, it's like they get stuck at that right. level of meditation and they don't go beyond it to calm abiding with the vividness and so on. And he, sa and he actually says the dullness part of that is a cause for a rebirth in the animal realm. Uh, because you, there's a kind of d subtle dullness. And if you spend years cultivating dullness, of course... <laughs> Uh, animals have a kind of more dull mind than humans, right. and so it's kind of creating a karmic tendency towards that dull state that then can, in the time of death, can lead to a rebirth in the animal. So it might be the similar point, I don't know, but Lama Sokap actually clarifies some of that. Right. And how to avoid that obstacle to meditation uh, so that you keep progressing and actually achieve fully-fledged comfort. But okay, so given what we said, let's definitely do our dedication. <laughs> <laughs> Right, and we dedicate to again. Uh, well, so let's do let's let's make sure we do three today. Right, so first one is the supreme jewel bodhicitta, where it has not arisen, may it rise and grow. Where it has arisen, may it not decrease, but increase more and more. And in the snowy mountain paradise, you, the source of good and happiness, all powerful Chinrezig Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until some sign. And then, since we were talking about, it, we can also dedicate, you know, through this merit, <coughs> uh, may I quickly achieve the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all sentient beings to that enlightenment.